Hey y'all, what is up? In this video, I am creating a portrait out of Posca pins. So if you aren't familiar with Posca pins, they are basically a marker that are filled with acrylic paint and you can draw with them uh, and the paint comes out of the nib. And so it's a little bit like painting and drawing at the same time, they're super fun. It is a very limited color palette because you just get the colors that come in the markers. Um, but yeah, and I'm basically drawing this in real time. There are some bits cut out where um, I may have been daring at the page or trying to decide on a color. <laughs> so um, what I'm gonna be doing is answering some questions. I've started a new Q&A segment over on my Instagram stories every Friday. Um, it's called Ask Me Anything. And so I'm gonna first include some of the same um, questions that I got on Instagram and um, so that you guys on YouTube can see them as well. But you can also head over to my Instagram stories and look at my highlights reel to see how I answered them over there and join me for um, the next Friday's session. So feel free to ask me anything. Suggested topics are of course about textile design, surface pattern design, art, um, building a portfolio, or uh, developing an art style. So uh, this first question actually came into my DMs and um, she says, hi, I'm learning a lot from these discussions. Is there also a contract template available um, that beginners could take a look at? And on the topic repricing based in location, I'm from the Philippines and if I sold a print to a small business within the same country, these dollar amounts would be too much to charge, lol, but I agree with keeping the copyright or charging higher if outright. So one of the um, topics over on my Instagram stories was pricing, especially in the surface pattern design arena and selling buyouts or, or doing art licensing instead and what you should be charging as well as freelance rates. And some people responded that, you know, if you go what they thought was, you know, considered to be too low, then that was lowering the industry standards and this and that. But I think it's important to get these perspectives as well, um, you know, from other countries that, you know, small businesses in those countries literally would not be able to afford US or UK prices um, and so, or Australian prices. So um, I think it's good to keep that in mind and just sort of you know feel that that's relative you don't have to agree with that but um you know some strong opinions out there over <laughs> pricing but um she also asks is there a contract template available somewhere that beginners could take a look at now i have to admit that i am not the expert on contracts and i do know um you know like my photographer for example used a site called honeybook um, and so if you wanted to pay for a subscription that kind of, you know, can handle everything for you online where your clients could just go in and sign the contract and everything is just kind of set up as a template. Um, I know that's a really easy one. I did it as the client and it was a really good experience from my point of view. Um, but some other people um, suggested uh, Christina Scalera's The Contract Shop and I have definitely heard of her. I haven't used her contracts, but I've heard that they're really good. So that's one to also look at and someone else suggested um, Pandra Design Co has been a good one and another person suggested Lumiere um, and yeah I've heard of Lumiere as well and so that's definitely one I would check out. The next person asks for tips on any kind of fabric rendering and I'm not exactly sure what this person is referring to but I think they're referring to mock-ups and I'm going to create a whole nother video on mock-ups but I, some of my favorites I found on Creative Market. You do have to pay for them but you know if you don't want to pay for something there are so many print on demand sites where you could upload your design, um, see it on a product and then take just take a screenshot like if you were just trying to see like if this design would go well with this type of product or something like that. And just as a disclaimer guys, um, I am more of a textile designer or surface pattern designer if you're new here. And I know I'm drawing this portrait here, um, but my background was actually in fine art. So that's why I was an oil painting major in college um, and I still dabble in a lot of fine art. I dabble in a little bit of illustration as well, um, but my primary kind of job is as 
a textile designer. But yeah, I was curious about using these Posca pins and so that's why I'm doing this portrait. Um, I just love working in these Posca pins. I've seen other artists using them and I'm so excited to continue using them. Okay, so the next person asks, what is the difference between fashion and textile designing? And I do think there can be some overlap here, but I would say that fashion generally refers more to apparel, uh, more specifically, and textile design is a little bit more of a broad term. It can refer to any kind of soft goods. So that could mean you know, curtains, uh, a rug, it could mean fabric, it could mean upholstery or pillows or shower curtains or kitchen linens, you know, anything like that. Whereas fashion kind of more specifically refers to apparel. Does the U.S. make a production of cotton fabric? <laughs> yes, if you are unfamiliar with U.S. history, the U.S. South has a really shameful history around slavery, all due to the amount of cotton production. So I'm just going to read to you real quick from this government website. The United States plays a vital role in the global cotton market, acting as a key producer and exporter of the fiber. In the marketing year of uh, August 2019 through July 2020, the United States produced nearly 20 million bales of cotton, representing about 7 billion in total uh, value. So yeah, the United States is still definitely in the cotton game. <laughs> How to start and be a remote textile designer. So I get a lot of people asking me this question about becoming a freelancer or how to work remotely or how to work from home. And my honest answer is maybe one that you don't wanna hear, but it is that I really believe that it's only beneficial to you to work in house and work for a company before you decide to be a freelancer. And I say that because it's gonna be just 10 times easier for you once you do become a freelancer or once you are working from home. It's just from working in house, you meet so many people um, in that industry, you make so many contacts, you build relationships, you network at trade shows and the people that you work with and buyers and clients and salespeople and just all kinds of people that you work with when you work in-house. And so I would highly, highly recommend to work in-house before you decide to be a freelancer. You just learn so much and like you're getting paid to learn rather than like you paying someone um, you know, to go back to school or something, you know, like that. And so um, it's definitely, of course, possible to work remotely as a textile designer, but it's so much easier when you already have those contacts and they know and trust you. People, you know, if, if they don't know you, they are kind of feeling like it's a gamble and they also just don't want to waste their time, um, you know, going through like 10 different freelancers, not knowing if they're going to be good and, you know, not knowing if they can get the designs that they need on time and things like that. And so um, if it's not possible for you to, you know, work in house, if you're not able to move for whatever reason, your circumstances just won't allow it, or maybe you're in a country or a state where you don't, um, have a lot of opportunities to work in-house as a textile designer, um, then I would say to maybe just start uploading some designs to um, some micro stock websites like Shutterstock or Creative Market or Pattern Bank and just start selling your designs little by little there until you build up more of an income. It's also important to make sure that your portfolio is just stellar and that you have a website that showcases your portfolio for the freelance jobs that you want. And that's really important. You need to have a portfolio that shows that you can do the work that you want to do. For example, if you're a graphic designer and you have a bunch of logos and branding and identity design, you know, kind of on your website, but you want to do textile design, you know, when people look at your portfolio, no one's going to hire you. Like it's, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry if that sounds harsh, but it's just like, would you hire someone who, you know, you couldn't see examples of the work you want to hire them for? 
probably not. And so you need to make sure that your portfolio is, um, you know, ready and that it's, it's good. And you can always be working on it and always improving it. And from there, I would, you know, start making a list of art directors. You can find them on LinkedIn. You can research companies and perhaps, you know, see if they have a design department or an email where, you know, you can maybe ask for general information and ask if you can have the contact information for the art director and, you know, pitch yourself. You know, you have to be able to pitch your portfolio if you want to do freelance work. And so that's a, you know, that's one way to do it. Also, you should look at print and pattern on Blogspot. They have an amazing blog and they have a really great jobs board and they're always posting new jobs there. Some of them are in-house, but some of them, um, you know, are for freelance and some of them, you know, they allow you to work remotely. So that's definitely one to keep an eye on as well. Who is your inspiration? I love this question because I don't know. I, I think I'm really just inspired by trends because they're so fresh and new and, and they're kind of futuristic and it's like what's up and coming. And I know a lot of people kind of hate on trends <laughs> because they can be fleeting and you know, it's sometimes it feels like overkill when everyone's doing the same trend. But I think that when you're really doing a lot of trend research and you see what's coming next, you're kind of, you're not oversaturating that trend because it's it's on the edge like it's it's coming and it's new and it's it's not saturated in the market yet so if you're always looking forward for me at least that's really inspiring to me um, I know a lot of artists say that they're inspired by nature but um, I would not say that about myself I love nature of course who doesn't but I mean honestly it's not like I'm walking around my yard <laughs> or I'm walking around outside and like drawing things that I see on my on my walk. No, I'm not really doing that. Um, maybe I could start doing that. I mean, maybe that would be a good practice to have. But realistically, like you have to find your own inspiration by doing a lot of research. And so I try to research, um, you know, trends, like trends that are up and coming. And of course, a lot of nature prints, um, botanicals, florals, that kind of thing sells. And so, hey guys, like I'm just being honest. I'm kind of inspired by what's going to be commercial <laughs> and what's going to make me a little bit of income right because I'm not doing this as a hobby I'm doing this for my job and so yes I'm not gonna jump on every single trend especially if I feel like it's not me or if it doesn't fit my brand or if it's not I don't know just inspiring me some trends don't inspire me but you know I am very inspired by things that are up and coming and you know something that I feel like is going to be successful in the marketplace Okay, this person wants to know what are the best job sites for textile designers and it's so funny y'all because back in the day I actually applied to jobs on Craigslist. <laughs> this is like 2011-ish and I don't, uh, I wouldn't recommend that now. I don't think that people are still posting jobs on Craigslist. Um, I really think LinkedIn is the best place to find in-house jobs. Um, you can also look on Indeed, but you know, if a, if a reputable company is hiring, then they're probably going to be posting the job on LinkedIn or using a recruiter. Um, so try to reach out to some recruiters in your area or that are in the textile design field. Also, if you are looking for, um, you know, other jobs, as I mentioned earlier, Print and Patterns blog on Blogspot has a really good jobs board specifically for textile designers. And so I would check that out as well. How much money is really possible to make online? Guys, I love this question because it just, it, we can go deep with it, okay? So if you've posted maybe three or four designs online or maybe more than that, and they're not selling, you might, it's, you know, it's really easy to get discouraged. You might feel like, eh, it's not worth it. The online marketplace is too saturated. It's too competitive. It's not working, but, this question says, how much money is it really possible to make online? And what's possible is we got to break it down into two different sections, okay, or two different ways of making money. And the first one is going to be active income. And that means things like freelance work where you're charging an hourly rate. Now, of course, you can continue to increase your prices as you become more experienced, as you become a more skilled artist. However, at some point, your income level will hit a ceiling 
because you only have so many hours in your day and at some point you know I don't want to say what the cap is because I don't really know but at some point you know you may hit a cap on how much you can charge per hour that's just the reality of it you can still earn a really really good income you know by charging hourly and of course you can get freelance jobs online there are sites like Upwork um, where some artists are doing really really well on it I haven't used Upwork so I can't personally recommend it one way or another um, from the artist point of view but yeah a lot of people are doing well with that and are doing kind of project by project basis now the other way to make income is passive income and this is where really guys the sky is the limit on how much money you can earn online now of course there is a finite amount of money i believe that exists in the world um so i don't want to say it's absolutely limitless but for argument's sake we can say that it's kind of basically limitless how much money you can earn online however let's talk about passive income if you don't know what passive income is it basically means that you're not trading dollars for hours you create a product or a design up front and then you sell it and you sell it and you sell it and you sell it and you sell it infinitely as long as someone wants it okay and so if you do a design that is a bestseller and it is selling on a site like creative market or pattern bank or wherever you're selling your designs it could sell over and over and over again now the reality is that at some point the kind of shelf life quote unquote <laughs> for online products does expire or does kind of dwindle down um, for example think about YouTube videos right youtubers can earn millions of dollars on a on a video that goes viral right but at some point like most people <laughs> have seen Charlie bit my finger for example um, and like we're not still watching it so at some point the income kind of dwindled off so you might be wondering okay well how can I earn passive income and you know if you're doing something like art licensing that's one way you can earn passive income digital downloads is another way and print on demand is another way and so those are the three i would recommend um, in terms of if you just want to design and sell design and sell and you're not really interested in building up an online audience or anything like that you can be low key um, you, you can be basically unknown and still earn a really nice income with art licensing digital downloads and print on demand now if you're open to wanting to build an audience either on youtube or instagram or tiktok or whatever social platform that you want to be on then you could be somewhat of an artist influencer which means you could get um, sponsorships it means that you could potentially get some ad revenue especially if you're you know putting videos on youtube and things like that and then there are some sort of mixed like active income and passive income revenue streams which is maybe something like patreon where the artist or designer can kind of set the levels and it can set you know what people are donating per month in order to support them and so it could be that that artist is creating content whether it's podcast episodes or you know youtube videos or things like that whether it's real time you know videos for their patrons but a lot of artists also ship prints monthly and that is like a very active form of income because they are doing something for their patrons every single month and so it's really up to the creator to decide how they want to do that but that is one way that's kind of a mix of like passive and active income and of course you know that num the number of patrons that you can have is kind of infinite like it's not infinite of course we know that there are less than 7 billion people on, on the earth but <laughs> but there are enough people that you could make a very very comfortable living and never have to think about money again and so that's what I mean when I say passive income it's really the sky is the limit you have to do the work up front and so it's kind of like a snowball effect where you have to do the work up front it is a big investment and you start out with like a marble size snowball like it's not much like you're gonna have to supplement that income with probably active income streams and freelance work um, and a lot of artists have multiple revenue streams I know I have multiple revenue streams but once those passive income channels start to build up and you've created you know first maybe you've created five designs and you've uploaded them and there some are selling and some aren't but by the time you've uploaded 20 and then 50 and then 100 
and then eventually 500? Well, those very first designs that you uploaded could still be selling. And so you're kind of exponentially increasing the amount of money that you can create because there is no guaranteed expiration date. You know, like these, these designs can continue to sell forever as long as the marketplace wants them. I've just got admission in Textile Designing University and I'm so inspired by you. Any advice for me as a newbie? Oh, thank you. That means a lot to me. Um, yeah, as a newbie, my advice is just to be a sponge. Learn everything that you can and get really, really good at Photoshop and Illustrator because it'll just make your life so much easier. <laughs> I uh, went into design after, you know, majoring in fine art in school as an oil painter. So learning the software was definitely um, a hurdle for me in the very beginning. And so if you get really good at Photoshop and Illustrator while you're in university, that's only going to make your life easier. And, you know, my advice is just to enjoy it because this is a creative profession and it's supposed to be fun. Um, so try not to let the little stuff stress you out and try to just enjoy the creative process. Also, congratulations for getting into the university and I wish you all the success in the world. So the next person asks, what software is necessary to know? And that kind of piggybacks off of uh, my last answer. And I would say you need to know, at least in, at this point in time, um, you need to know Adobe Photoshop and Illustrator. Now, if you are trying to learn on your own and you can't afford the Adobe subscription, then I would highly recommend downloading Affinity instead. There's Affinity Designer, which is like the cheaper version of Illustrator. And there's also Affinity Photo, which is the cheaper version of Photoshop. I'm really annoyed that Adobe has kind of forced this subscription model on us. Like I really don't like it. Um, you know, back in the day I had paid a couple thousand dollars for that software. And now I have to continue to pay. So like in my mind, I shouldn't have to pay ever again, you know, unless I chose to, unless I wanted to maybe update my software, but I shouldn't have to. Um, and the fact that they forced it on me, I really don't like. And so I've dabbled in Affinity products um, and sometimes they have a sale. Last year I bought Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer for only $25 each like mind blown, mind blown. That is so much cheaper than Adobe. And of course it doesn't have all the bells and whistles that Adobe has, but honestly, like I don't even understand. I don't think the, the breadth of what Photoshop can do. Like I only use it for very specific things. And, um, you know, I am still using Adobe at this point in time because I just got so used to my, uh, my shortcuts and my ways of designing, but I am determined to learn a lot more about Affinity Photo and Affinity Designer because I would really love to get off of the Adobe subscription model and switch and just have it paid for, you know, for $25 each. I mean, that's a dream come true. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't afford Adobe, I definitely recommend Affinity. Um, and you know, when you start working for a company, they may require other software, um, but they will train you on it. They don't expect you to know, you know, these kind of nuanced softwares like Texel is one example um, in rugs and they don't expect you to know that before joining the company. So they will train you on that and truly, truly knowing the foundational skills of Illustrator and Photoshop will easily transfer to a different program like that. So I wouldn't sweat it. Just make sure that you know Photoshop and Illustrator and you'll be good. Textile design job opportunities and best job sites for textile designers. Um, so I kind of touched on this earlier, but if you look at print and pattern on Blogspot, they have a great jobs board. Otherwise, I would look at LinkedIn, um, try to connect with art directors and pitch yourself to them. Back in the day, Behance, I think they've been acquired by Adobe, but Behance was one. Coraflow was another one, but I don't, I don't know how many people use it nowadays, but it could be worth looking into. Um, so yeah, just do a little Google search and see if you can find other ones. But off the top of my head, I know, of course, LinkedIn and print and pattern. For selling raster or vector files, do you use microstock or print on demand websites? Um, 
I think that for either raster or vector files, I mean, you could use either one, but I don't think that microstock or print on demand websites require one file or another. Now I could be missing one, but in my experience, you know, as long as your raster files are high resolution and they're, you know, saved at 300 DPI um, at a certain size, um, such as all of my patterns, for example, I do at 12 by 12 inches at 300 DPI to make sure that it is big enough. Uh, you know, you can always scale down the size uh, when you're working in raster, but you cannot scale it up beyond the original. With vector files, you can scale up or down infinitely. And so if you want more flexibility with the scaling and the ability to, you know, scale up or down however many times you need to, then maybe you should work in vector, like, because that's not going to be an issue for you. But yeah, I mean, with print on demand, I think, I don't know this for a fact, but my gut feeling is that everything is digitally printed, which means raster files are no problem. I've also heard some people ask if vector files sell better and that has not been my experience um, but you know maybe it has been someone else's experience maybe maybe depending on the site they're posting it on maybe depending on the type of artwork they're doing maybe it's for a certain type of industry who prefers vector files I don't know there are there are a lot of possibilities out there but for me that has not been my experience and there hasn't been any issue with selling raster files again as long as they are in high resolution and the next question is kind of related to that do you sell more raster or vector patterns um, and it's so funny because I really started out as an illustrator girl in terms of I worked in vector and I was all about working in vector because I just didn't want to deal with the enormous Photoshop files, you know, to, to have that high resolution. But I ended up working for a, a textile design company that only worked with raster files and, you know, they didn't. They didn't force me to work uh, in Photoshop, but because we shared so many files, it ended up just becoming easier for me to work in Photoshop. And now I really do work in Photoshop a lot. I also bought an iPad Pro and now work a lot in Procreate. And I'm also getting back into doing some traditional medium such as gouache. And of course here you're seeing me work with Posca pins. <laughs> and so I could technically um, scan in this portrait and I could live trace it and make it into vector but then I would lose maybe some of the marks um, but the Posca pins are so flattened that or they have kind of a flattened look so I think that would actually be okay but a lot of times when I'm painting in gouache now or working in procreate that actually translates a lot better to Photoshop and so I've been using Photoshop a lot more and it's kind of like oh I never would have thought that like I always would have thought that I would want to work in vector but yeah it's funny how things change so I would say that right now I'm selling more raster files just because that's what I'm creating more of um, but I do work both ways and it's not like I never work in vector I definitely do it just depends on the design and the way I feel like working that day um, basically and what I want to use it for so I still have a um, or I have a licensing deal with a hospitality rug company and they do request that everything is in vector so all of the designs I submit to them are in vector um, so it really just depends on the client um, and if you're uploading yeah to a to a micro stock site or a print on demand site I really think you can do either one Okay, so now we'll dive into some questions that were in the comments um, from my YouTube videos. And so some of these I've already kind of chatted with people in the comments, but I did want to include them in case some of you maybe had some of the same questions. And so uh, Miriam says, I'm an intermediate student and want to become a textile designer, but I'm not good in drawing and need your guidance. Love from Pakistan. Oh, love to you too from the United States. Um, hugs. <laughs> but you don't actually have to be good at drawing to become a textile designer. There are a lot of different styles in textile design, but if you think about some of the textile designers that primarily do geometrics, they're really not drawing those designs by hand. They are using, you know, shape tools. They are maybe drawing or using the pen tool um, in Illustrator or Photoshop to create more shapes. Um, but a lot of times they're using just very straight lines and holding down the shift key to get that straight line. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, you don't have to be good at drawing to become a textile designer. So I really wouldn't worry about that. It might just alter the style that you have, um, which is totally fine. You don't have to have an illustrative style. Now, if you were gonna become an illustrator, I would say you do need to be good at drawing. But for textile design, your style can be a lot more geometric and a lot more um, stylized that way. Abby says, hey there, I was wondering in your opinion if I am a graphic designer, do you think I could step into a textile designer position if I already have color design and apparel experience? Thank you. Absolutely. So my very first job, <laughs> my career has kind of been all over the place, guys. Let's be real. I started out as an oil painter in college. That was my major. Um, I had one graphic design class in college. That was it. Um, and then I was a nanny for a year and did some graphic design classes online. And then I was a graphic designer for four years working for a t-shirt company. That's exactly what I did, guys. I started out as a graphic designer and switched into textile design. So absolutely you can do it. The key, now this is important, the key is to have a portfolio of textile designs, right? Show that you can do the work so that when you go into an interview, you're not bringing you know, your past work at your company. I mean, you could have some examples if they wanna see if, and have questions about your job and wanna see what you did at your, at your current job or your previous job, but you need to show a portfolio that has textile designs in it, not just logos or brand identity or catalogs or web design, you know? That's not gonna be relevant to a textile design job. Like, yeah, like maybe they could see that you are kind of good with color, but they might say, oh, those colors are, that's great for graphic design, but that's not gonna work for textile design. You know what I mean? People are trying to kind of curb their risk when they hire someone. They do not wanna take a risk on you, so you need to show them that you can do the work verbatim, right? Like that's, that's my advice, is just make sure your portfolio is good and that it reflects the work that you want to do. Kaz asks, how much does it cost to print your own fabric? Um, guys, actually, I've never printed my own fabric, um, which might sound crazy because I do have a licensing deal with a fabric company. However, um, if I was going to print my own fabric, I would just go to Spoonflower and look at the prices there. I think that that's kind of the path of least resistance. Um, and so I would just check out prices on Spoonflower. There may be some other sites, but I do think Spoonflower has um, different substrates and you know they have some options for you there. So I would definitely check out Spoonflower. Uh, Hannah says, I'm confused. I read that fine art is the same as illustration. Is it right or what? <laughs> um, no, fine art is not the same as illustration. Fine art a lot of times is um, not meant for commercial purposes. Um, there could be some overlap there um, and some crossover. However, fine art is generally um, created based on a message that the artist wants to say to the world. Um, or it could be an expression of his or her own emotional state or philosophical point of view or something, you know, existential. It could be a lot of different things. Um, it could be a reflection on society or a comment on society as we know it. It could be, um, you know, that they're getting inspiration from some point in history. Um, whereas illustration is going to have much more of a commercial purpose. I would also say that in illustration, you need to have good drawing skills, and in fine art, that isn't necessarily the case anymore. Once upon a time, it probably was the case that you needed to have good drawing skills, but nowadays, fine art has kind of branched out into, um, you know, performative aspects. You know, I always like to give the example of Duchamp um, with the Dada uh, movement, where he just flipped the urinal upside down, and that was art. You know and so he didn't have to have good drawing skills to do that and so i would say that's what some of the key differences are in my mind but the big one is going to be that illustration is going to be for a commercial purpose i'm sorry i'm not sure i was told that if you learn graphic design and illustration your pay gets higher um yeah so I don't think that's a guarantee necessarily. Um, I do believe that in general, graphic designers are paid more than illustrators um, as a whole. And you know, we could get into what some of the reasons for that are. 
I have to say I believe that more men are graphic designers and more women are illustrators. I mean graphic designers definitely are also sometimes women but there are more men in that field um, so we know we know that women are paid less in the US for the exact same work. Um, I believe they make something like 70 something cents on the dollar for the exact same work and so we do know that, <laughs> but you know, if you learn graphic design and illustration, of course it makes you more versatile. And so as a graphic designer, if you have some illustration skills, that could help you because the more you broaden your skills in any industry or in any, you know, kind of job, then that's only going to help you and kind of make you more versatile. But I would say that you should learn what you enjoy the most and focus on that because when you enjoy the work that you're doing, um, and of course there are going to be days, you know, that it feels like work because um, it is work, but you know, focus on what you enjoy doing the most because you're going to be better at it when you enjoy doing it and then when it doesn't feel like work all the time. And when you genuinely enjoy what you're doing, you're going to become better and when you become better, you get paid higher. Um, and so that's not to put a cap on, you know, what graphic designers or illustrators can make because there are definitely some super, super, super successful both graphic designers and illustrators out there. So it's not to say that it's not possible, um, but just as a broad average or generalization, graphic designers too, do tend to make more. But yeah, I mean, learning some illustration could um, improve your skills for sure. Vanessa says, thank you so much. I'm applying to art school and I was so confused about whether I wanted to major in graphic design or illustration. Now I know thanks to you. Now just to get accepted. Wish me luck. Oh, good luck, Vanessa. And I'm so, so happy that you now know what direction you want to go in. That's huge. It took me a while to figure that out. So I'm so happy that you're doing that while you're in school. Amanda says, feeling a little overwhelmed with a lot of goals and managing my time to achieve those goals. Glad I'm not the only one. Haha. <laughs> Thanks for sharing your 2021 goals, working through your Skillshare classes, and saving up to enroll in Textile Star. Have a good new year. Oh, thank you so much. Amanda watched my studio vlog on my 2021 goals. And if you are a designer, I do highly recommend writing down some goals for your quarter and for your year because when you write down goals, you're definitely more likely to achieve them. However, I totally understand Amanda. Sometimes I'm way too ambitious with my goals and I need to just go easier on myself because I tend to think I can accomplish way more than I actually can. Um, and, I, and things tend to take longer than um, I imagined. So I'm so glad that you're working through the Skillshare classes and I would so love to have you in Textile Star. For those of you who don't know what Textile Star is, it is my signature course on how to become a textile designer for literally a fraction of the cost that it would take for you to go enroll in university and get a whole new degree in textile design. As I mentioned, I used to be a graphic designer and then I switched over to textile design and I learned so, so much on the job and so I learned and then I worked in textile design for seven years and so from learning so much on the job I want to just be able to educate you guys so that you can walk into the interview knowing all the things that I kind of learned on the job <laughs> it's amazing I got hired in the first place but yeah I want to equip you guys so that you can really kick some butt in your interview okay Madhavi asks how to learn free textile design um, you can definitely teach yourself um, and maybe just try to look up tutorials on YouTube. YouTube is free for everyone to use and so, you know, I think that that is one way to learn. Um, it's not going to be in order and so you're going to have to kind of realize what you need to learn next and try to look that up on YouTube. Now, Skillshare is another really amazing platform where you can learn a lot of things um, and it is I believe only nine dollars per month and so that is a really low cost way to learn and you can you know watch as many classes as you want to on Skillshare um, so yeah I know that sometimes you don't want to pay for things and we want to try to learn for free um, and YouTube of course is a wonderful resource for free learning Okay, so the next set of questions are about Pattern Bank. I did a couple of videos on Pattern Bank. The first one was how to sell on Pattern Bank and I went over some of their tips found in their newsletter and you guys loved it so much and were so interested in Pattern Bank that I ended up interviewing Neil Elliott from Pattern Bank. He works there, he's the director and we had like almost a two hour conversation um, 
or at least an hour and a half, I believe, conversation all about, you know, how to be successful selling on Pattern Bank as a designer. And so I highly recommend that you guys check out those videos if you are interested in Pattern Bank, but I'll also answer some of your questions about Pattern Bank here that you maybe didn't get answered in the video. So someone says, quick question, is it true that Pattern Bank only pays 50% of our fees? And the answer is yes, that is true. But guys, that's actually a pretty good rate. Um, if you work with an agent, they generally take around 50% um, of the commission. And so, you know, I think that's pretty standard, honestly. Other sites do not pay that much. For example, if you're an artist or a textile designer, you can upload your designs to Spoonflower as well and sell them there. Um, however, Spoonflower only pays the artist 10%. 10%. So that's why you don't hear me recommending Spoonflower very often because that's a pretty low percentage. Um, I recommend Pattern Bank um, because the the commission is 50% and that's actually pretty good. So um, in print on demand, I don't know what they all, you know, what all of their percentages are, but I can almost guarantee it's not 50%. And of course they have the cost of physical products and inventory and warehousing and all of that. So I understand that. Um, but yeah, Pattern Bank, a 50% commission is pretty good. So yeah. Sarah says, Hey Lauren, thank you for the amazing video. I'm new to your channel and I'm really liking it. I had the same question as the last question asked as I had a look at Pattern Bank today and I noticed their social media, um, Instagram, I didn't check others uses the designer's repeat tile with any crop marks without any crop marks and i just saved a, f a few to test how easy it would be to steal designs and indeed it was so easy the images were 640 by 640 pixels i do hope they start adding a watermark to uh, avoid problems in the future maybe you could ask neil about it i will try in the future to join the platform if i'm lucky i would feel a bit safer regarding that issue for sure thank you for your awesome work Hi Sarah, I totally understand the fears um, behind putting your work online and a lot of artists have so many fears about copyright issues and their work being stolen and their work being ripped off. My advice might be a little bit unconventional, I don't know. My advice truly is just to try not to worry about it. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but it's just part of the game if you're gonna be a designer. Um, and I wouldn't worry about the images that Pattern Bank is putting on Instagram. I am sure that those images are low resolution, which means no one could just take them off Instagram and print them and have it be like print quality, like quality that you can actually print and put on a product. Highly reputable companies, um, you know, they care about their reputation and they're not just gonna steal art especially off of Instagram where everyone can see, you know, who posted it originally. Now there are some Chinese companies, I believe Shen, Shine, I don't know how you quite say it. It's S-H-E-I-N. I believe I've seen um, them take some direct copies from artists, but basically what they're doing is they're having their own artists recreate it verbatim. That is plagiarism and it is not okay. And it's not okay when companies do that, you know? Um, so, you know, we have some issues with that in, in China um, and other countries, but, you know, they just probably don't have the same level of strict copyright laws that we have here in the U.S. And so, you know, it might just not be a priority or as important to them. I mean, it sucks, but it's, it's kind of just part of it. And my question to you would be, you know, are you going to let that stop you? Are you going to let that stop you from becoming the designer that you want to become? because the designers that really get ripped off the most are the ones that are at the top. They are super popular, everyone loves their work, they're high level, highly talented, and so I really wouldn't worry unless you feel like you're at the top and you are like a world-class artist, you know, that people are going to rip off. If you are still a beginner or if you are still relatively unknown, I don't think, I just really don't think there's much danger in anyone ripping off your work, especially from Instagram. There's so much art on Instagram. Just imagine this. Let's say you were a, a company who copyright was not an important value to you. Then what would you choose to rip off? What would you choose? You're going to go after the designs that have thousands and thousands of likes, things that are kind of quote unquote proven to be highly popular and highly loved by by people. 
And so if that's not happening, I just don't think it's something that you need to be worried about. And if you are that top designer that has, you know, thousands and thousands of likes and your work is super popular and you're at the top, hey, good for you. You probably have an amazing career. And yeah, it sucks that you probably will get ripped off at some point and you have the option, especially if it's a direct copy and it is plagiarism and it falls under the obvious plagiarism category, then you have legal options there that you can pursue if you choose. You know, that's the way our system is set up. And if you want to seek justice, you are well within your rights to do that. I personally wouldn't want to waste my time and energy unless it was something really, really, really bad. And from what I've seen in the textile design industry is that when an artist maybe does send via their lawyer, you know, a cease and desist letter, what the company then usually does is offer to pay the artist a royalty for all the sales that they had on that product that was questionable, whether it was influenced by the artist or whether it was a direct copy, you know, some of that stuff is debatable, but usually what the company is, will do is offer a royalty and it's usually settled that way so that it can kind of avoid the courtroom. And so that's one, you know, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not giving legal advice, but I have seen that happen in the textile design industry. So yeah, that's just to give you some ideas. I think, you know, not putting a watermark is, um, is okay on pattern banks, you know, Instagram. I don't think it's going to be a big problem for you. However, on your own Instagram or your own Pinterest pins and things like that, I would put your own logo and your website, um, kind of as a watermark or just maybe at the bottom or somewhere small, just in case someone screenshots your design and they want to contact you later you know, then it's easy for them to find you. If they screenshot or pull your design, it doesn't mean they're trying to steal it or copy it. They might just, you know, be thinking, oh, like I'm trying to find some new artists or some, I, I really like this work. And then that way they can find you later on and contact you and say, oh, like we'd like to license this from you. Um, and so I would recommend putting your own watermark or on your designs when you are posting them online. Thanks for this much needed video on Pattern Bank. It's so helpful. I'm so eager to join, but I don't have an online presence, no website or social media. Can I still join? I do believe that Pattern Bank wants to see a website portfolio from you. Um, and so I, I love using Squarespace. That's what I would recommend, but there are definitely other ones. I think some people use Wix, some people use Shopify, some people use WordPress. Um, so you can maybe find a free one uh, or a very inexpensive one to join. But yeah, I do think that Pattern Bank requires you to have a website. I don't think that a social media presence is necessary, but they do want to see that you are a professional designer and they want to be able to look at some kind of portfolio because they are being very selective about the designers that they admit to their, to their site because they want to provide the highest quality designs for their customers. And we can all understand that, right? So yeah, I mean, they, I think they say that on their requirements and I would say just follow their requirements before you apply because once you apply and if you get rejected, you cannot reapply. You're rejected forever. <laughs> and so definitely follow their guidelines before applying. That would be my advice there. Olea says, can you make a living from selling on Pattern Bank? Absolutely, absolutely you can. Now the first month or two or three months that you are uploading designs from Pattern Bank, it's probably not gonna be a full-time income <laughs> because this is a passive income channel, remember that. But like we talked about earlier, once you have 50 designs on the site and then 100 and then eventually 500, imagine that many designs. I mean, think about the law of averages. The law of averages basically means if you have enough of something or if there's a high number of something, at some point it's going to average out between, you know, the yeses and the noes or the sales and the non-sales, let's say. And so if you have a certain number of designs on the site that are high quality, absolutely you can make a living from selling on Pattern Bank. I would recommend that you check out some of their featured designers and kind of see what they're doing, you know, what a top selling designer on Pattern Bank is focusing on, you know, what are kind of some of the color schemes that they're using? What are the, um, what are the subject matters that they're using? Are they focusing on trends? Are they focusing on more botanical designs? You know, just kind of look at that. That's not to copy, that's just to get an understanding for what really works and what really sells well on the website. 
Hey Lauren, first of all, thank you. I wanted to apply as a designer on Pattern Bank. What I'm not sure about is, it says to upload 12 samples, but that's it. Do the samples have to be a certain size? Do they have to be layered or can it just be JPEGs? So I'm going to read directly from uh, the page that says how to sell on Pattern Bank from Pattern Bank's website. And they say that selling designs on Pattern Bank couldn't be easier. Click now and you'll receive a confirmation email and click on become a seller. Pattern Bank will take you through the procedure. You will be asked to supply your full details, your current online presence, where you are currently selling, and then you'll be asked to upload 12 designs. Now, to be safe, they don't give like all the details about what kind of designs and, you know, this person is asking about JPEGs, but to be safe, I would upload PSD or AI files because just from selling on Pattern Bank, that's what you have to do for every single pattern that you sell on the site. They literally review every single one. Um, and so I would upload a, you know, a Photoshop or an Illustrator file with layers. Um, so make sure your work is layered, especially if it's in Photoshop with Illustrator, that might not be necessary. And I would make sure that the size is 12 by 12 inches and 300 dpi. Um, that's just, you know, a good size to, to do and to make sure that um, you're not going to run into any resolution issues because if Pattern Bank thinks that you don't know how to do high resolution, then they're not going to approve you, right? So if you do that and then your patterns don't have any mistakes in the repeat so definitely double check your repeat and make sure that it is repeating and there aren't any mistakes and that the file is really really clean um, then you should be approved and i wouldn't worry about it too much um, but yeah just make sure that you are uploading quality work that you would be uh, confident selling tasha says i am curious how long the trends that are featured on pattern bank last and that is a really great question because of course you don't want to pour a ton of work and energy into a trend if you know if it's only going to last for a couple of months right like you want the trends to last so that you if you put a lot of work into it that they can continue to sell for a long time the problem with trends is that it's really the marketplace that decides how long those trends last sometimes trends can last for years and sometimes they have a shorter seasonal cycle but I would recommend designing in trends because when I had the conversation with Neil Elliott, who works at Pattern Bank, he really recommended that you follow the trends because so many of the customers on Pattern Bank's website are in the fashion and apparel industry and they are looking for things that are going to be on trend. And so, yeah, I would definitely recommend following the trends. Um, you don't have to do it for every single pattern. You could definitely include some classics, but it is a good way to also get featured on Pattern Bank's website. If you are following some of the trends and you name your design the same trend name, then it might get featured on in multiple places on the site where they are showcasing those trends. Seema asks, if others have different tastes than you, then whether to make them believe in your design or to modify it according to them. So that is kind of the million dollar question in terms of being an artist, right? Um, I would say fine artists generally don't modify their artwork for a, an end client, but it, it also doesn't really have a, as much of a commercial purpose. If your work or your goal is to be a commercial designer, then you may need to modify your work um, in order to satisfy the client that you're working for especially if you are an in-house designer you kind of have to do what your boss says sometimes <laughs> of course you can give your opinion and try to um you know fight for your work and, and get people to believe in it however sometimes you know your your boss or your art director has more experience in the field than you do and um they're not always going to be right but a lot of times they are right and you should try to learn from them also if you're going into a field like art licensing it is kind of good to have your own style and your own take and kind of to stick your flag in the sand somewhere um, you know as people say but so in terms of style if you are an independent artist and you're trying to get into licensing then in terms of style I don't think that you should necessarily modify your style however again if you are um, trying to sell your work commercially then you may need to modify some things so that it does have viability in the marketplace again because you want to sell your work. This is a job, not a hobby, right?
Lyra says, hello, thanks for the tips. Do you recommend priming the paper of the mixed media Canson sketchbook? So I have a few videos um, all about, you know, sketchbooks and how to paint in your sketchbook, um, especially with acrylic paint, because there aren't a lot of sketchbooks out there in the marketplace that are designed for acrylic painting. Um, and it kind of annoys me. <laughs> and so I've actually created my own sketchbook with canvas paper for this exact reason. But if you are going to buy a regular sketchbook with regular paper, a lot of times your options are like a mixed media paper or watercolor paper, which is not great for acrylic, right? Because watercolor paper tends to absorb a lot of water and it really gets to be too dry when you are painting with acrylics. And so, yes, I definitely recommend priming the paper um, when you are working in acrylic. This also prevents the paper from warping or getting kind of distorted and wrinkly, right, when you're painting with acrylics. And so what I recommend when you're working in a sketchbook and it's any kind of unprimed paper is to clip down the paper and go ahead and put down one or two layers of gesso. Let that gesso dry so that the paper dries flat and then you can paint with acrylics on top of that and have absolutely no problems. Willow says, hi Lauren, thanks for sharing these wonderful tips. Lately there have been many designers using Procreate for surface pattern designs. Would you recommend Procreate for creating designs? Um, so I have to say, I'm a really big fan of Procreate. I absolutely love using it. Um, I wish I had had it, you know, in the last 10 years of, <laughs> of being a designer, but I did not have it. So it's not necessary. Like it's not something that you absolutely have to have. And let's be real, iPad Pros are expensive um, and you have to have an Apple Pencil and all of those things. Um, if you can afford it, then yes, highly recommend an iPad Pro and Procreate. It's so fun to work with and it feels like you're really drawing. It's kind of the next best thing to actually drawing on paper. But for many years, I used a Wacom tablet. You know, it was nothing fancy. It was nothing overly expensive. And so you can definitely start out on something like a Wacom tablet and still draw in Photoshop or Illustrator. Um, I did eventually buy a Cintiq so that I could draw directly on the screen. Um, you know, back in the day when I was starting out as a graphic designer, I was just drooling over the Cintiq and just couldn't imagine being able to actually draw on the screen. And then, you know, eventually, years and years later, I was able to save my money and actually buy a Cintiq. And then I, uh, you know, maybe a year or two after that, I bought an iPad Pro and have started working in Procreate as well. And so now I have two options for drawing on screen. And I have to say, I do enjoy drawing on the iPad Pro in Procreate more so than my Cintiq. Now, I don't have the nicest Cintiq out there. Um, I think I paid around $1,000 for it. So if the screen is like fairly small, it's not to say that other Cintiqs might not be better, but um, it's like I still have to use my keyboard and I'm still using a laptop, so it's like a little bit of an awkward um, thing because I'm kind of going back and forth from my laptop to the Cintiq because um, I don't have tons of buttons on my Cintiq, so all my shortcuts, you know, and when I'm in Photoshop or Illustrator or over on the keyboard. Whereas in Procreate, you can do everything just with different taps or different um, you know, different little things that you can do for quick shortcuts um, in Procreate. You don't need a keyboard to do any of that stuff. And so that's one thing that I also really love about Procreate. And it just feels so natural drawing in Procreate, whereas the Cintiq is just bulkier and, um, and I don't know, I feel like I get a little bit more lag when I'm drawing with the Cintiq. And so, yeah, I would say I prefer Procreate, but don't feel like you have to have it to get started as a designer. You can absolutely use um, a fairly inexpensive Wacom tablet to start out. So Willow had a follow-up question where she says, thank you so much. I'm trying to avoid a Photoshop or Illustrator subscription at the moment. Totally understand that and would Procreate as a standalone app suffice or Procreate and Affinity? Yes, absolutely. If you are avoiding Adobe, which they deserve to be avoided because they should not force a subscription on anyone, <laughs> that's my opinion. Um, but yes, you could absolutely use Procreate and use something like Affinity Photo. Um, Affinity Designer is Vector and Procreate is a raster program and so you want to keep that kind of seamless. Now you could 
maybe use Procreate and Affinity Designer, but I don't know at this point in time if Affinity Designer has a live trace option like Illustrator does. And so I think it's going to be a lot easier for you to use Procreate and Affinity Photo. In Procreate, you can work in layers very similar to Photoshop or Affinity Photo. And so it should preserve those layers when you bring, you know, something like a Photoshop file into Affinity Photo. Um, so yeah, you can definitely work that way and avoid the Adobe subscription. I think Adobe is going to see more and more people doing this because their products are just so, so expensive and not everyone needs, you know, the robust features that they all have. Um, so something like Affinity is going to be a really great contender. Okay, so now I'm just kind of finishing up some of the hair over on the top here and I decided to give her eyes a nice green color because it coordinates so beautifully back to the green leaves in the background. Um, it just kind of gives her eyes that pop too. Um, and with Posca pins, you really are limited in colors. Like you just are able to use the colors that exist because they're basically markers. <laughs> and so the nice effect that it has is that all the colors end up coordinating together really, really well. And it's a really beautiful color palette, um, but you don't get to really customize the colors like you would if you were really painting with acrylics or using another medium. So now I'm just going to finish up some of the leaves here in the background as well. And so for those of you who might be wondering who this girl is, there are so many royalty free photos online. Um, I tend to look at Unsplash and Pexels. Those are a few of my favorites. I also recently um, bought a subscription to Shutterstock, so I'm downloading like monthly images from there as well. Um, but I believe this girl I found either on Unsplash or Pexels. I can't remember exactly which site it was, but if you want to practice portraits and you don't just want to draw yourself, <laughs> um, then Pexels or Unsplash is a great place to find royalty free photos of people. So you can just practice from, you know, some of those royalty free photos. So yeah, so if you've ever seen this girl before, then um, I'm not copying anyone, I, I promise. <laughs> uh, this is a royalty free photo that I'm using and I really just wanted to get better at my illustration skills and I also wanted to get better at using these Posca pins. I absolutely love the way they look. Um, they do remind me a bit of working in vector because they are so flat, but yeah, I just love the colors as well. and. Um, Overall, they're just really fun to use. And so it's a nice break from, you know, working digitally all the time. And so when you're really in the mood to work in a more traditional medium, then Posca pins are a great option. I really love them. And of course, if you have any questions for me, um, just, you know, if any of these questions that I answered maybe sparked another question that you're curious about, then make sure to check out my Instagram stories every Friday. That's when I'm answering questions from you guys and I'll have the question box up in my stories. So you can really ask me anything you want and get a faster answer. Or of course, feel free to leave a comment here on YouTube and I will try to include that in my next Q&A video. If you haven't already subscribed to the channel, then make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss another video from me. And if you liked this video or learned something at all, please give it a thumbs up. That helps the YouTube algorithm know what kind of videos you like seeing from me. I hope that you enjoyed this video, guys. I love you so much and I'll see you in the next one. Bye, guys.